Okay, so uh, we saw the temptation of uh, Satan. Uh, as far as under the curse, chapters 3 through 5, we saw the temptation, the condemnation, the salvation. And so that's where we pretty much left off last time, and I'm going to keep going from there. Uh, John, can you push that black button for a couple seconds and then let it go so we can get some air in here? That'd be very good. Amen. All right, um, while he's doing that, uh, remember I mentioned that Adam named his wife Eve after they had already sinned. What does Eve mean? Ladies, one of the ladies. Not a very common name, I've noticed. I had a, an aunt named Eva, but uh, Eve is not a very common name. I have lots of great names in my family line, right? <laughs> uh, you know, Moses and Enos and uh, all these great Bible names. So, Eve. Eve means what? Mother of all living, which is odd, you know, because she's the mother of all dying also. Uh, I just, I really mean that. It's very true. So, um, God made for Adam and Eve coats of... Daniel? Animal skins. Um, what had they made for themselves? Jacob? Aprons out of fig leaves. An apron, uh, and by the, the Hebrew word itself, and we think of it as a, a kitchen apron. That's not the proper meaning of that. But just the Hebrew word itself, though, for the apron, definitely signifies a much smaller covering. And the, the robes, sorry, the coats of animal skins, that word in the Hebrew is very similar to our understanding of a robe, literally from from the neck to the toe to the feet. Uh, it's a complete robe. And so it's interesting that they tried to cover themselves up in their sin. And God came along and covered them with the blood, sorry, with the skin of an animal that cost that animal its life and its blood. So this is the first example here of, of a sacrifice. Now, I mentioned this last week, and so I want to continue with this thought again, that... Uh, I believe that God taught them everything they needed to know to live in His world that He made for them. And so I believe that God started them in the understanding of many scientific and uh, habitat for humanity. There you go. Uh, many things in order for, just to show them how to take what He had already made put things together, combine things, build things. Um, people talk about the invention of the wheel and all that kind of stuff, or, you know, reinventing the wheel. Wouldn't be one bit surprised if God showed them how to make those kinds of things. Maybe not the way we make them today or as strong, but certainly uh, God showed them how to live in His world. He also showed them and taught them how to sacrifice now, you find that uh, with Cain and Abel, uh, that Abel knew how to sacrifice and Cain brought the wrong sacrifice, but the point is that they knew. They had a clear understanding of how their sacrificial system was supposed to work. Now, it wasn't like you know, the books of the law where that it was a lot more detail, but uh, they certainly understood how to, how to make a sacrifice. And that's very important to understand that from the beginning, they were instructed on how to kill the lamb, what kind of a lamb, how to present that before the Lord, and only a certain way would please the Lord. Because Cain and Abel then come along, and, and down through each of these uh, patriarchs, no, they're not called patriarchs, they're you know, the people before the flood, these ten big generations that are listed up through the time of the flood, um, they all knew how to do this sacrifice the right way. And so there's several examples of that. Of course, Enoch was a man who walked with God. Seth was a man who walked with God. Enos, I believe, was also a man who walked with God. And then Methuselah, uh, he was a good man, the father of, father of Noah, yes. So this salvation that we're talking about, this was made very clear, abundantly clear for these people to learn how to, uh, how to sacrifice. Okay, um, 
My next main point then, I call this, I'm trying to keep it alliterated, kind of alliterated, you know, the same sounding. Degradation, degradation. So we saw the temptation, the condemnation, the salvation, and now forth, the degradation. That means the destruction or the sin that came upon man. Yes. D-E-G, R-A-D, degrade, to degrade someone. Degradation, that's the word. D-E-G-R-A-D. A T I O N. Did you have that? Yes. <laughs> to degrade. It means it means that the situation deteriorated. That's the idea. Well, what do we find where do we find that? In chapter four. So let's go to Genesis chapter four. And let's see how quickly it degrades. <clears throat> Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. Now, that's an interesting phrase there. I have gotten a man from the Lord. She didn't just mean that I have a male. You know, hey, my first son. She thought that she had, I believe, the seed the seed that's mentioned in chapter 3, verse 15. When God promised to Eve that her seed would defeat the devil, she assumed, as is commonly believed here from, this, from what she said about this son, she thought that she had that seed. Little did she know that she had thousands of years to go and all kinds of you know, sin and families destroyed and, and broken apart and unhappiness and misery in the world as a whole because of what she had done before that seed would even come. But she thought she had the seed. I have gotten a man from the Lord. Now, I just love to think what life was like back then. You know, they, didn't, they didn't know anything about children, having children. They didn't know anything about life and death. I mean, they had never experienced it. What happens to a person? There's still, to this day, mystery. Now, we know what the Bible says, but to the world, there's a huge mystery about what happens to a person when they die. You imagine the mystery they had. What, what do you mean, die? What happens to them when you die? Well, you stop breathing. You fall over and you stop living, you know? <laughs> anyway, so... They had really, uh, I'm sure, uh, very, uh, it would have been very odd from our perspective to look back there and see what they thought of death, what they thought of, of uh, oh, what's the other thing? Anyway, just a very different perspective they would have had. Cain, when he murders his brother, what do you think would happen to him when he beats him over the head a whole bunch of times? You know? You probably didn't think, what, what do you mean die? No, we didn't think of death commonly, you know. You do that to a person's head and they're going to stop breathing after a while. Anyway, he just hated his brother and he was jealous and he wanted to hit his brother really hard a bunch of times. He probably didn't know that that's what the result is. Anyway, it's just interesting to think of. So, we see this uh, first murderer in the world, Cain, and here he was supposed to be, in Eve's mind, the, the seed that she got from the Lord. Now, what about Cain? Let me mention a couple things about him real quick. Uh, Cain, of course, brings the wrong sacrifice. And again, I say he knew what to bring because he'd been taught from Adam and Eve, who'd been taught from the Lord. They knew exactly what to do. And Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock, and of the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. Cain is very angry. Now, by the way, God right away shows his mercy. God gave Cain an opportunity to bring the right sacrifice, and Cain refused. Cain said, I, I, this is my offering. You take it or leave it. And uh, God, of course, didn't accept that offering. Um, so Cain... <clears throat> was given an opportunity to repent. I think that's very, very clear in the passage that he had an opportunity to change his mind and that God would have given him mercy. Listen, our God has always been and always will be a God of mercy. Uh, when people say, well, I just can't stop this sin. No, the reason you don't stop that sin is not God's fault. It's your, you just like it too much. <laughs> 
you go to God and ask for mercy and you mean it and he'll give you mercy and he'll help you. So Cain had this opportunity and he passed it up. So anyway, of course, we know the story. He ends up uh, killing his brother and uh, he asks a rhetorical, and we act like sometimes this question is not for us. You know, he said, am I my brother's keeper? The answer is yes, you are your brother's keeper. You're responsible for your brother in some way, at least partially. You're, you're supposed to be, as Jesus put it much later on, a neighbor to everybody you meet. So yes, you are your brother's keeper. <laughs> um, it's not just Caleb and Austin. It's everybody we meet, is, uh, it, we're responsible to help them if they need it or to talk to them and encourage, whatever. You know? And as far as soul winning, that definitely applies. All right, so Cain <clears throat> kills his brother. Let's see what he does then next. The Lord puts a mark on Cain, puts a mark on him. What was that mark? Oh, we don't know. Look at verse uh, 14. Cain says to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth. From thy face shall I be hid. And I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth. Everyone that findeth me shall slay me. The Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. All right, what, what, any ideas? I have no idea, to be honest with you. Um, this mark was something visible, something that everybody could see. Any ideas, John? I thought you were raising your hand. Oh, yes, go ahead. Yeah, that's right. Good. Sure. Which is not physically possible. Which is not physically possible. And anyway, so that's a ridiculous argument. <laughs> um, they've changed that, their saying of that now. They changed their interpretation of that now because they used to not like black people at all. And now it's not uh, very politically expedient to be that way. So they've changed their, their beliefs. It could, it could have been some form of a known emblem of God at that time. Since God did walk with man at that time, God could have been known as a certain image of sign of protection uh, hmm. against him, though possible punishment. Hmm. That would have been destroyed once God stopped walking directly with man. Interesting. I, uh, did you just think of that? or have you? That, yeah. Okay. I've never heard that before, but that's, that's an idea. I'd look into that. Okay, <clears throat> verse uh, 16. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife. Whoa. Where do you get a wife? Because up to this point, we don't know of anybody. You know, so maybe did the Lord make him a wife like he made Adam and Eve? So now we have another line, you know, to intermarry. Where did he get his wife? His sister. Juliana says, and then she cringes. <laughs> <laughs> Sister. All right. Any, anybody else? Anybody who thinks it was his sister? Oh, wow. Cringe. <laughs> um, any thoughts on that? If it was his sister, give me some thoughts on that. Yes. Well, is it, is it really known that God didn't create any more people? I mean, God specifically states about creating Adam and Eve, but we get this, I, mean, I don't know, they could have, I could have created more people and just didn't um, state it. Genesis 1.27 says, In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. But it's pretty much normal to believe that that was an overview, not that that right then he created a bunch of males and females. Any other thoughts? All right, since you're not going to give me your opinion, then I'll give you my opinion. Yes? Well, uh, the, I was always taught that the bloodlines back then and the genetics would allow for intermarrying. Okay. Okay, so, th which is true, which is certainly true. And I'm sure Mrs. Uh, Jennifer Wright uh, talks about this in Creation Science, right? About uh, the genetics being different. Maybe not. Okay. Um, I'm sure she talks about, the, not this story, but the genetics being much more pure and so on in the early days of the earth, uh, which is certainly true. The, the common thing that we 
as you know, our little families, in our 70 years of existence, on an average, 80 maybe in America, I think it's a little more than 70 now. But what we think of is growing up with somebody and then marrying them, which is not the case. Okay? Um, God said that Adam and Eve were going to multiply and replenish the earth. So, how many children did they have? They certainly had more than three. Okay, Cain, Abel, and Seth. That was not the end of... Th those are only the three that are mentioned. Cain and Abel are mentioned because of the story. And Cain murdering as an... This is an example of what sin did so quickly. First family, the first child born was a murderer. <laughs> you know, don't think that you can't be a murderer someday. Because if it can happen to the first one born, then it can happen to anybody. Anyway, but Cain was certainly the first boy, I believe, according to what she said. I've gotten a man from the Lord. This is the man that, I, that we need. This is it. And, you know, she didn't know he was just one in the generations and generations. So we know of Cain and Abel, and we know of Seth because he replaced Cain. I'm sorry, he replaced Abel. Abel was dead. So we only know of three. How many children did they have? Probably, uh, you think I'm crazy, I think they probably had several hundred. What's to prevent them? Okay, what's to prevent them from having several hundred children? Um, Gideon, through many wives, Gideon had 70 sons. That was, that was many, many, many years later. Now, he had many wives, I understand that. But before the flood, if you know about that time period, of course, the earth was much more healthy. The air was much, obviously, almost completely pure still at this point. Uh, global warming hadn't affected things yet. Um, Man-made, uh, you know, okay, never mind. Um, but anyway, the earth hadn't been corrupted yet. And so they probably had many, many children. Let's say that Cain leaves, you know, moves away from home when he's 50 years old and he lives away for 100 years and he comes back and there's a 100-year-old sister who's 150 years younger than him. It wasn't like they lived with him and grew up with him and then married him. Okay? Anyway, so it was almost certainly his sister. Maybe much younger than him, which is often the case you know, in our society. People get married at 22 and 23 years old. That was not normal back then. Uh, people, Joseph was 40, or I think they believe, when he married uh, Mary, if I remember right. And, and on and on. Uh, Jacob, Jacob in the Bible, he was 77 when he married the four wives. Okay, so... People lived much longer, and they got married much later. And you see people here in, Psalm, in Genesis chapter 5, if you read through it, you'll see that they got married. No, I'm sorry. We don't know when they got married. But often they had their, the son that is listed often was at 150 or 200 years old or more. So it's not unusual for, you know, for people to... Uh, get married later on in life and then have a bunch of children, younger and so on. Anyway, lots of different ages. Any questions or thoughts on that? Sounds kind of ludicrous and kind of ridiculous. Now, when people are out soul winning, they ask you, you know, I want to know who did Cain marry? Please don't go into hold. Listen, I'll explain that to you later. Let's talk about salvation first. Because uh, when you tell them that he married his sister, they're never going to listen to another word you say. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. Um, so did, um, when, after Cain killed and murdered Abel, did he flee from where his parents were staying? He, he just moved away. It says he went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod. So I don't know, I also when I heard the story, unless you it was, he got kicked out, but he wasn't necessarily kicked out of wherever his parents were staying. He just ran away. He ran away. He became a fugitive, yes. So then when he came back, it says that, um, the Lord put a mark on him so no one would want to kill him. So when he came back, no one still, still wanted to kill him because he had that mark. That um, I, obviously not. That they didn't want to kill him or that they didn't, I don't know. But so you're saying... That's because of the mark, though. 
Cause right. Says, um, so if he had that mark, why would they want? Why would any girl want to marry him? Right? <laughs> if he had a big tattoo. <laughs> I, I don't. Anyway, I'm not completely following your question. Can you get that again, <sighs> please? Um, I'm not completely following your question, but. So in verse 16 it says, um, the, we're not the from Lord the. Sat mark upon King, lest any finding him should kill him. So when he came back, everyone knew what the mark meant because they would kill him. Right. And people definitely knew what the mark meant, yes. But I, I anyway, I don't really understand the significance of it and why that was necessary. Uh, that hasn't made any sense to me. I don't, I'm, anyway, I guess I've stopped trying to figure it out because I can't figure it out. What it exactly meant. Why would they want to kill him in the first place for being a murderer, I guess? But anyway, why would a mark prevent them from wanting to kill him? And that's the hard thing for me to understand. I have no idea. So, okay, we need to move on. <clears throat> uh, let's see here. Oh, by the way, one thing it mentions here is that Cain built a city. Cain built a city. Verse 17, he builded a city and called the name of it after the name of his son, Enoch. That is not the Enoch that walked with God later on. This is a different Enoch. Um, but here we right away already see the the family generations developing without the Lord, rejecting the Lord. Okay, let's move on then. Last, underneath this section of the curse upon man, chapter 5 is the enumeration. There you go. The enumeration. To enumerate something means to count it, the numbering of it. And in chapter 5, we see this uh, line of human beings living, having children, dying. Those three things. Living, having children, dying. So we see that they were, were born. They continued this hum line of humanity in their line. And then they died. Now that seems like a very morbid Summary, right? In chapter 5. What do we call this chapter often? A chapter full of the... Oh, come on. My little kid coming out in me again. The begats, right? Hello. Am I the only one that thinks like this? This is the begats, right? They begat so-and-so. And, -so. and so many years after they lived, or after they had this child, then they died. And then it says the same thing continues on for generation after generation. Which, by the way... The numbers listed in chapter 5 are accurate. I know, it's the Bible, right? But they're accurate. So we know from these numbers, we know how many years went by from the time Adam was created until the flood takes place. These numbers in chapter 5 give us the, uh, the details of that. They're accurate. Yes? To the flood, about 1,656 years. Now, that's, um, I believe that is from the, the birth of their, of their son. I'm almost sure. Um, verse 3, Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image. So no, it's not. It goes back to the creation. And called his name Seth. The days of Adam after he begat Seth were 800 years. He begat sons and daughters. All the days that Adam lived. Okay, there it is. Yes, it is. 930 years. How old was Adam when he was created? <laughs> right? He was zero when he was created. And then a year later, he turned one. <laughs> Poor guy. Right? How, uh, <laughs> obviously, you surely know and can assume that he wasn't a baby. You know? He got, he got uh, abandoned, you know, when he was a baby in the Garden of Eden. You know? He, uh, he lived there in the Garden as a grown man. Which is odd, you know? 
Which was made first, the chicken or the egg, right? It's that type of thing. Jericho. What was cooked first, the chicken or the egg? Oh, oh okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so <coughs> the begats. They lived, they had children, they died. Uh, think about this. Isn't that uh, such a picture of sin? Here it is. Um, in this chapter alone, it mentions Enoch, mentions him walking with the Lord. That's a part of this. Methuselah. But in chapter 5, about uh, 1,500 years goes by. Just in the blink of an eye and it's gone. 1,500 years with almost no information about life in the world. There is some, but very little. Think about that. That's life and death. Life and death. And these people <laughs> lived longer than anybody else in history. The longest living people in the world, their life is just zapped up that quick in chapter 5 of Genesis. And hardly anything said about them. Abraham lived 175 years, and we have like a dozen chapters written about him. But here are these people who live so long, and their life is just gone in a snap. And uh, I think it's great. Illust a great illustration of life when, when they rejected God that quick I mean it was gone it was over it wasn't impressive to God at all that they lived so long and another another very interesting thing and I don't have time to go into it, but Psalm 90 is written by Moses Moses lived a number of hundred years after the flood of course and, and of course even at Moses time they lived longer than they do now he died at 120 but that was just because it was his time to go, not because his strength was abated or his age hadn't gotten to him. He's 120 years old. And what did Moses say in, in uh, Psalm 90? He said, a thousand years are as a day in the sight of God. And there's no question in my mind because he's talking about in the old days. You know, it's us, we think in, in Moses in the old days. Moses was talking about seven, eight hundred years before him that people used to live a lot longer. And those thousand years that they lived, these long lifespans, were as a day in the eyes of God. And then he says, and later in that chapter in Psalm 90, he says, and all we get is 70 years, and if you're lucky, you get 80. <laughs> it's not fair, is it? But it's the result of sin. Sin shortens life. Sin, sin brings an end to, to life. So... Of course, you know that. The punishment for sin is death. And it's very true. And this chapter is full of death. Death, death. They all lived long lives, and they weren't very fruitful and productive. They just, they lived, and they had children, and then they died. It's pretty amazing. The enumeration, the listing out of the generations. All right, now that brings us to the next main section. Uh, we talked about the uh, creation. We talked about the curse. Let's see here. We now look at the catastrophe. The catastrophe that came with the flood. All right. Let me uh, give you a little, little opinion here. This is my belief here. Chapter 6. came to pass when men began to multiply in the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wise of all which they chose and the lord said my spirit shall not always strive with man for that he also is flesh yet his days shall be in 120 years i'm going to shorten his life because they're living too long in their length of life they're able to do much much more uh, to harm themselves and to sin against me so i'm going to shorten their lives um, how much have you learned since you were 12 years old? Right? A lot. You've come a long way in six years or whatever, eight years or whatever. You've come a long way. Um, when I was 20, that was 21 years ago, I've learned a lot since I was 20. 
and off, I mean, just things, even things how to do things and the best way to do things. <laughs> um, for me, right? Uh, things that I say, wow, I like the, I'm going to do it this way because I like this. This is the way it works for me. So I've learned a lot in 20 years. Imagine if you had 600 years to perfect your craft and how many crafts you would learn. I'm going to take this 100 years and I'm going to focus on, right? I'm going to learn, I'm going to be a sailor for this 100 years. <laughs> then I'm going to be a metal worker. I'm going to, have to learn how to make things with metal. Think about the skyscrapers and so on that are built using knowledge that was accumulated just over a short period of time. And on and on. It's, you know, when, when, when we find these things that were left over from the old world, like pyramids, like things in uh, Mexico City, and by the way, there are thousands of these kinds of things scattered around the world. These come, I believe, from this time period. Before the flood, they weren't completely covered up. There were, by the way, many things that are never going to be seen again until, you know, they're going to be destroyed in the end times because God covered them up with continents. <laughs> Try digging that up. Um, <laughs> they're gone. The Bible says in 2 Peter, the world that once was perished. Now, that doesn't mean there's no sign of that world. But there's very little sign of it for sure. So they're very scattered uh, uh, things that are left from that time period. And very few. So God said, I'm going to shorten their lives. And that's a very important thing. How did he shorten it? We believe, I believe, that when he took away that protective bubble around the earth of that water canopy, that, it was, that that in itself was going to shorten life. The rays of the sun... Oxygen level is not nearly as high, and I love to think about all what the world was like. Um, have you ever heard of uh, these oxygen chambers? What are they called? The barometric? Bar Hyperbaric. Hyperbaric. Baric, is that the name? Hyperbaric chambers. And supposedly, you can have a deep cut, and a day or two later, it's completely gone. No scar, no nothing, completely gone. It heals up that quick. Um, it's believed that people could easily, and this is from the size of bones that have been discovered of, of human beings, the size of uh, footprints that have been discovered, and there's thousands of these kinds of examples. You can find this all over the internet, because it's true. <laughs> um, but you can find a lot of this kind of stuff now, especially with the age of, of the internet. Um, but it's really interesting, it's believed People were bigger. Of course, lizards grew much bigger in what we call now dinosaurs and so on. There's lots of things that are very interesting. That everything grew. Um, I've heard of uh, tomato plants producing 10,000 huge tomatoes in these kinds of hyperbaric chambers. Um, they just produce and trees would have been massive and just on and on and on. Um, people could have run wouldn't that be fun? You can run around the lake in a few minutes and not be tired. Um, anyway, how did people cover the world? By running. By running. And they could run for half a day and not be tired because of the oxygen level and so on. There's a lot of interesting components to these theories uh, that make it very, very interesting, I think. All right, well... That's not really the catastrophe, is it? Yet yeah, we're, we're getting there. All right, now verse 4. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. Now I want to take a few minutes here and discuss this. Sons of God came in unto, that means they married the daughters of men and had children by them. The product of that marriage was giants in the land, mighty men of old, men of renown. So, who were those sons of God that married the daughters of men? Who were the sons of God? Who were the daughters of men? 
<laughs> Great question. I'm glad you asked. Any, any ideas? <clears throat> Who were the sons of God? Let me give you a couple of possibilities. Diego. The line of Seth. It's possible that the sons of God is the line of Seth. The Sethites. Okay? They're the godly line, the sons of God, marrying the daughters of men. That's possible. The, the, the problem with that view, and I'm not saying it's not true, the problem with that view is why does that produce giants? Because there's, that's clearly the connection to there. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that when the sons of God came to the daughters of men, and they bear children to them, the same became mighty men which are of old men of renown. Yes, David. Ah, David. John. The fallen angels. They were fallen angels is another theory. Fallen angels. Okay, who are fallen angels? Those are demonic creatures. Why would you say that? John? Why would you say that? Why, why demonic creatures? It says they're sons of God. <laughs> okay. So are these good angels or bad angels? They're bad angels. Obviously, they're bad because of the context, right? Sons of God, daughters of men, so they were bad angels. Any other thoughts? It could be the angels that the Lord cast out of heaven. Which would be the demonic angels. But why, why, where do you get angels, demonic angels, from these verses? It says they were sons of God. Diego? It's in reference to angels. Okay, you mentioned Job, so let's turn over to Job chapter 1. In the book of Job chapter 1, by the way, it's understandable that the spirit world, which I'm not being creepy or mystical or anything, it's reality, okay? There is a demonic world. There is the, the you know, the heaven. There is the, the angels. You know, you can call them what you want to call them. Call them guardian angels. But there are angels. And there are demons. So we have our kind of names for them. And, you know, the weird idea is that, you know, you become a guardian angel if you get your own wings and the bell rings, you know. <laughs> but there is certainly angels that protect us. I mean, that's what the angels did for Jesus. You know, they, they'll bear thee up, lest that any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. I mean, that was the guardian angel of Jesus Christ. I mean, call it what you want to call it. It's an angel. Well, there are also demonic worlds. And look what these demons did in chapter 1 of Job, verse 6. Now, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. Now, this term here, the sons of God, is not talking about like Jesus was the son of God. It's clear reference in the Hebrew. The, the, uh, it's a clear reference to, to uh, demonic spirit, to spirits. And when it says here, the sons of God, this is not in reference to a good thing, a, you know, as if they're the sons of God here. These are evil spirits presenting themselves before the Lord, and Satan is one of them. He's among them. There's a lot of interesting things there. We don't have time to dig into it. But by the way, the book of Job was written probably before the Pentateuch, probably the first book of the Bible written, the first record. So a lot of people believe that Job... Was, was written either right after the flood or even before the flood. Anyway, there's, it's a very early book. So the point is that there's things in the book of Job 
about God and the angels and the devil that we don't learn in many other places. God gives us a little insight into this. But what happened here? They present themselves. So we know that the demonic spirits and the devil report to God. <laughs> they, are, they are under his authority. That's very important to understand. That's a, that's a, a principle that we learn here in Job chapter 1, verse 6. Look again in chapter 2. Now, this is the second time that this takes place. There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. So, Satan did present himself. The demons presented themselves. And the sons of God, the meaning there is it literally has something to do with angels, demonic angels. So, is that the same word that in the Hebrew that's used in the book of Genesis? And the answer is yes. It is. Yes, Caleb. Um, have you ever heard the argument? Because I know I actually heard a whole series this morning on the sons of God in Job. And um, he was actually saying that the sons of God was referring to people on earth that were like making requests or praying to God and that Satan was like, I don't know, I don't exactly understand what he was trying to say, but have you ever heard that view of Okay, say that. What were they so identified as? The sons of God were actually people, like, praying to God or, like... So these are godly people. That's what he was saying. Who intermarried. No, in Job. He was saying the oh, sons oh. of God in Job. Oh, oh, they, I you see. You know, coming to men and the Lord were actually people on earth, and Satan was, you know, also coming to God, and, like, Okay, I've not heard that, but um, I would be open to certain, <laughs> certainly open to looking into that. My understanding, and I don't know Hebrew, but my understanding is that that is the same word as used in Genesis chapter 6, and it, and it could certainly mean uh, on a spirit level, not on a human level. Let me give you one other passage that also... And maybe you have an answer for this too. I don't know. Job 38 verse 7 is another time where we see this used. Job 38 verse 7. Uh, here the Lord is speaking to Job out of a whirlwind. And he says, When the morning stars sang together... Oh, back up. The whole, the whole context of the passage is, Job, where were you when I created everything? Where were you? And the, the answer, the obvious answer is, um, I wasn't in existence. <laughs> man was not in existence when the world was created. So the, the, the rhetorical answer is nowhere. <laughs> nowhere. I wasn't around. Verse 4, Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Verse 5, Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? The point is God laid the foundation. He stretched it out like a measuring tape. And he put everything right where he wanted it to keep the earth level. He measured it out. He said, oh, I think I'll put a continent over here. I'm going to put an ocean over here. I'm going to build up a bunch, you know, later on. I'm going to put the mountains here and the, drain the ocean or make the oceans deep to balance things out. I, God can do all those things very easily. Now, verse 6. Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof of the earth? What's it fastened on? <clears throat> Nothing. <laughs> it's just hanging there in space. Who did that? God did. Now, nah, verse 7. When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So here is angels, in this case, good angels shouting for joy. Or probably at this point is all the angels. So if you have an answer, I don't know if you have an answer for that, Kayla. Or it probably fits the same narrative as what you were saying earlier. But Okay. But the point here is that the sons of God are angels. So it's believed, Genesis, uh, Job 1 and 2, that those were evil angels. These are good angels, but they're all angels. Anyway, so those are some of the times, very few times, where this phrase, the sons of God, is used. And it says in Genesis chapter 6, now let's go back there. <clears throat> The sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair. They took them wise of all which they chose. Verse 5, they produced giants. Now, 
Um, by the way, I, I mentioned this theory. The problem is that why would it produce giants? I would say, I don't know if you had this verse in mind as well, but um, another argument is that they were just godly people. Again, wh why the giants? So, anyway, I'll just say, and it sounds kind of weird, whatever, but I don't know personally how you get past this second meaning, understanding of Genesis chapter 6. Now, there is one big drawback. Let me just give it to you. In the book of Matthew, yes, Matthew 22, 30, the Bible indicates there, the angels of heaven do not marry. They don't get married. Of course, then I would say, well, these aren't angels of heaven. They're angels of the great pit. <laughs> They're angels of the devil. And anyway, it just, with the verbiage that's used and the production of giants, it seems to me to be very possible that this is the case. And by the way, you don't find any godly giants in the Bible. <laughs> no, that was coming from me, because you know, I'm short. Yes? There's actually a paragraph from Dr. Williams of the Creation of the Bible. Yes. It says, children born in certain marriages of human, they say that, except that they probably, I'll say they would control the serpent and go and beat them. It wasn't necessarily the, the demons themselves marrying these daughters of was actually, was men that were being possessed by demons, mm -hmm. controlling those by giving them such great size, it says that the Hebrew words are translated from many means fallen once. Fallen once? So, mm -hmm. so he's saying that people like how the maniac is able to do such powerful things. Mm -hmm. Sure. And he that kind of contributes to yeah. So I think it still fits the idea that these sons of God, whether they were actual demonic angels themselves coming down and actually physically marrying these women or possessing these men on earth and somehow producing them, causing those women that they married to have giants as, as uh, offspring. Anyway, still seems to fit. Very, very interesting. Caleb, only a couple more, sorry. I don't want to take all day on this. Would necessarily the giant necessarily be with the size, uh, the height of the men? Does it say that, or could it possibly be their abilities? Because you know, there we refer to some uh, people as giants in their field. Sure. You know, men of renown right. could be a reputable person. Right. That's a great question. Uh, let me take a couple of thoughts, and then I'll. Continuing on his thought, uh, my dad actually did study on it, and he seems to think more that it was just mighty kings or mighty. People, rulers in the land. Sure. Like the or sure. Okay. There are obviously this issue is not a life or death, salvation or you know heaven or hell decision. I understand that, but I will say there are very good people on both sides to figure out what this is. So if you believe different than me, fine, but don't call me a heretic. <laughs> okay. Um, I believe that this is the case. And as I have looked at the word there, the men of renown, and the study of what that led to, who, who were the later giants that came along that were probably a part of the line? Who knows, you know? Of course, I know the flood happened after this, whatever. Uh, but, oh, no, never mind. That doesn't apply. But you, you get, uh, anyway, don't think that this is life or death situation here, you know, if I believe. But I will say, until a few hundred years ago, as I have looked it up and I've tried to find who believed this, you know, writers, writers, biblical writers, writing on this passage, what did they say about it? And even several hundred years ago, I get the impression that about everybody believed that these were demonic possessed, demon possessed people marrying the, the daughters of men. So it's been a long held belief is my point. Take that for what it's worth. Okay. So, who's number one? Who's number two? Ah, uh, never mind. We won't, we won't get you to decide who's who here. Okay, so you see some pros, some cons. 
of each of these views. Any questions? Any other comments? Andrew, did you have something or oh, last I chance? Have a question about the singing stars. Like, could they have been angels? <laughs> Well, there is actually some thought on that, and this is not the place to talk about it, but I think in that book, or maybe some other book by Henry Morris, they do believe that there is something to that, that stars actually make noise. And so, I've never heard it, except when I was dreaming. <laughs> you know, I ate a bunch of pizza one night, and I was just, I heard these stars singing all night long. So... Right, it was beautiful. <laughs> then I woke up. Okay. So that's the reason for the flood, is the sons of God came to the daughters of men. Whatever it was, that's what happened. <laughs> sons of God married the daughters of men, produced men of renown, and I think, yeah, yeah. Anyway, I've heard that argument, actually, Daniel, by the way, very much. I, I forgot about that. The word giants can, is a different word here in Genesis 6 for the word giant than it is in uh, 1 Samuel 17 with Goliath, who is a giant, or the sons of Anak in the book of Joshua. So it is a different Hebrew word, so it, sometimes there's the opinion that it's interpreted differently, not meaning actual physical giant. I will say, however, there have been huge fossils found of three foot long footprints of men, okay? That's like twice the size of Shaquille O'Neal. So Shaquille O'Neal is like, he used to be when he was playing, he was 350 pounds and seven foot one. So you're talking a 550 pound man that was uh, easily 12 to 14 feet tall. Yes? Oh, no, that point. <laughs> Here we go. Fun stuff. Yeah, but I mean, on that point, uh, like we're not the smallest people in you know in creation. There's animals that are a lot smaller than us. Animals that are a lot larger than us. But in you know we have the dinosaurs and stuff, which we massive compared to our physical bodies nowadays. So it makes sense. Fortunately, if yes. human beings back then were much larger than they are Absolutely. nowadays because everything grew sure. much larger. Absolutely. Can you imagine a 12 foot tall person running a race <laughs> in the days before the flood with the oxygen levels as they were? I, I've, I've talked about this before, but not in here. But, it, it, you know, you think about the, the, the ramifications of that. For, for a 12 foot person to run 50 miles would have taken an hour. Just scoot along, when you get there, you're there, you go visit grandma. <laughs> Think about how fast they could cover territory that way. Cover the earth. You know, in a week's time, you know, the whole family could run along, uh, you know, and just jogging. It's, it's really pretty ridiculous, out of control to think about. I, I enjoy thinking about that stuff. Okay, that's the reason for the flood, regardless of what it all means. Um, second, let's talk about the preparation for the flood. This is all under the catastrophe. The preparation for the, for the flood. Uh, let me mention a couple thoughts to you. <clears throat> uh, we see, first of all, Noah's character underneath this. Noah's character. Uh, the Bible says in verse number 8, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah found grace. Um, God's goodness. What, what that means is not that, uh, that God happened to notice. Oh, I'm going to destroy the world. But whoa, whoa, there's this, like, this one light shining at me. And it, it's Noah. No, no. It literally means that God was looking for some way not to destroy everybody. Noah found grace. God was looking for Noah, looking for somebody. And he searched the world over in his grace. 
He searched the world over and he found Noah. He wanted to show grace. What is grace? The goodness of God. It's not really, it's the opposite side of the coin is the mercy of God. God wasn't saying, I should really show mercy to somebody. Okay, there's somebody I can show mercy to. No, no. God was looking for somebody to show his goodness to them. And he found Noah. And, uh, of course, we know that the, the story goes from there. But Noah's character, he was a man who, uh, well, where am I at here? Verse 9, there it is. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. He's one of these who had learned from his great-grandfather, I think it was, great-grandfather Enoch, what it meant to walk with God. Now, I, I forgot this part of it. And this is a fun part. Do I have time for this? No, I don't, but I will do it anyway. Um, I did a, a study years ago on the chronology of the flood. If you figure out how long Adam lived, oh, I better erase some of this, from chapter 5 of Genesis through the beginning of chapter 6, if you take Adam's life and he lived 930 years and you put this on a timeline to Noah, and he lived 600 years uh, before the flood. Okay? This 930 years and Noah's 600 years almost connect by about 100 years. Noah missed Adam by 100 years. Or less than 100 years, if I remember right. You understand that? So... It's like 50-something years, or, or no, it's about 100 years. I forget exactly the number, but it's, it's really amazing. So that means, of course, that Adam and Enoch overlap by a couple hundred years. Why was Enoch so godly? You know, chances are they, they knew each other, you know. They ran for two days and covered 200 miles and visited each other. <laughs> Uh -huh. um, but Enoch walked with God. Why? I believe because he talked to Adam. And on and on. These people overlap each other. Uh, the world before the flood. An amazing, you know, so much stuff there. So many things there that can be talked about. I, I'm just now thinking of in chapter 5 where it talks about the music that they developed. And the uh, metal, metallurgy that they developed, working with metals, combining different things together, minerals and chemicals and things from the earth, combining them together to make metals, and on and on. Very, very developed world. A lot of people believe, Henry Morris believes that there was over a billion people in the world by the time of the flood. That's one-seventh the number of today. So... Just a lot of very interesting things. But the chronology of that, look that up sometime. Fit in all of Genesis chapter 5, where they were, and you'll see all of this overlapping here. Um, Methuselah, of course, the Bible says that he died the year the flood came. Part of what Enoch also, why he was godly and walked with God, is when his son was born. His son was Methuselah, and the name Methuselah means when he dies, it shall come. He was some way warned, Enoch was warned, of the coming judgment of God in a great flood. And from that time on, when, he, uh, when Methuselah was born until, it, until the flood came, no, sorry, until Enoch was taken away, he walked with the Lord. Did you know that we have some of Enoch's sermons in the Bible? Enoch was a prophet and a preacher. Don't look it up. Are you, are you Googling it real quick? <laughs> no, you go ahead. I'm kidding. Anybody know where that's found? Enoch's sermon. It's very clearly listed. You see I'm towards the back of my Bible. You don't believe me, I can tell. Uh, Jude, verse 14. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam. Now, that, that in, a, in itself is amazing. Did you know that Enoch was the seventh generation in Genesis chapter 5 from Adam? 
Jude says this, the seventh room Adam prophesied of these saying, Jude had Enoch's sermons, probably on MP3 or, you know, <laughs> his, uh, had CDs that were passed down, developed by Lamech <laughs> in, in Genesis 5. Um, what did Enoch preach? Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. I think Enoch likes to preach against the ungodly. <laughs> Just gathering that from his message. Isn't that something? Uh, the world that was before the flood. It's amazing stuff. All right, we got to get back to our notes here. Noah's character, we saw that. He was a just man. Man's corruption, next. I want you to see man's corruption. Man had become so wicked. The Bible says every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Man was corrupted. So what did God do? He instructed Noah to build an ark for the saving of his house. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 11. For the saving of his house and of course, we believe that many, many, many others could have and should have also been saved on that ark. Uh, it's probable that the entire top level of the three-storied ark was for people, was for human beings, and they all uh, rejected it except for Noah and his wife, three sons and their wives. And again, chances are Noah had other children who were caught up in the world and rejected the Lord and were drowned. Um, so the preparation for the flood. Next, I want you to see the ark's instructions. If you haven't written that down, did I give you that already? The instructions for building the ark. The ark's instructions. This ark is a barge-like structure, not a boat. <laughs> uh, there is a difference. It's a barge-like structure. Um, it was built as a big box. Who has been to the Ark Encounter in Kentucky? Ken Ohio? Ohio. Kentucky. All right. Anyway, a few of you have. Uh, I haven't been there. I want to go there. We'll go there, I think, next summer. I want to see the place. But just to get an idea. But it was built as a, a box structure, not as a ship. Um, it was not meant to sail. It never sailed. It just floated and bobbed and supposedly if you go to the ark you can to the one in Kentucky not this one um, if you go in the ark they explain some of the logistics of how it was built they explain how it would have survived the impact of the water hitting it and uh, the, the rough nature of the water uh, during this time where the earth literally is thrown into you know, total chaos. Um, what caused that water canopy to fall? Who knows, right? There's several theories. There's a meteorite hitting it. There's the foundations of the inside of the earth opening up and spraying out and breaking that water canopy from the inside. Uh, there's lots of theories on that. But literally what happened, the Bible is very clear on this, uh, towards the end of chapter, in chapter uh, 8, Verse 1, the foundation, I'm sorry, verse 2, the foundations also of the deep, sorry, that's when it was stopped. Let's go back to verse, uh, chapter 7. Verse number 11, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. And that's again where this idea of the water canopy, that the, literally the windows of heaven were opened. Um, that that canopy was broken. And so the earth was just completely thrown into chaos. And, uh, you know, and again, we, th we can't even fathom the destruction that was instantaneous and then also prolonged through uh, this 40 days and almost a year, a total of about a year of the great uh, the flood coming back down upon the, or into the oceans, draining off the continents and into the oceans. And then, of course, the water uh, cycle beginning, 
Uh, it's the beginning of the water cycle as we know it today. And lots of, you know, everything was totally changed after the flood. The world of the uh, world before the flood was very different. Okay, the size of the ark, you know these things, but let me give them to you. 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. That's 15 foot stories, 15 foot stories of each level, of the three levels. By the way, that's a minimum. That's assuming the cubit. The cubit being about 18 inches. If that cubit is based upon much bigger people, then it's going to be much bigger than this, which is entirely possible. Jericho? Yes, 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. The Bible says it was pitched. Within and without, that pitch, it's a great uh, word that's used there in the Hebrew. It's the first time, well, it's not the first time, sorry. But it's one of the times in the Old Testament where it, the idea of the atonement, the covering, the word that we get our word atonement from is the same word that's used here of a covering. That's what Jesus does for us. He covers our sin with his blood. And this ark was pitched within and without and covered with that pitch. Well, what was the pitch? <laughs> Any ideas? What was the pitch that covered the ark? Amy? Um, sir, I was reading that book, Henry Morris, and they said it's possible to that um, uh, the ark was covered with the water. She pitched and was Sure. Sure. So it's the same as somebody else used. So what is it? It's Egyptian. <laughs> <laughs> it's Egyptian. No, it's not Egyptian. It's, it's, you know, wherever Noah lived, you know? <laughs> so Jacobed stole Noah's idea. What is pitch? Help me out, somebody. What are these guys doing out here in the back of the property today? <laughs> Jericho. Pitch as in like a substance. Huh? What is it? Like a sack of substance meant to seal. Okay. Somebody tell me some more what it was made of. What would it have been made of? John? Tar. Tar? Okay, oh, hang on. Where does tar come from? Hmm? Is it crushed up rock that's heated or something? Uh, no. Well, there's more that's added to that. that. That well, you're thinking of asphalt. That's crushed up rock and then tar added to it. Where does tar come from? Fossil fuels, as we call it today, oil, petro. So, that's pitch. When was the oil made? <laughs> After this, <laughs> right? So it probably was not tar. Not right, right. They didn't cover it in black tar. What, what would it have been made of? What is another thing that also is a um, that is also a pitch? Tree what? Sap. Thank you. Tree sap. Certainly. Look at the word sometimes. There's a long, interesting study you can do about the word that's used here for pitch. And it has to do with trees. It has to do with uh, sap and so on. It's very interesting. Um, there's, there's a name. Uh, oh, well, anyway, that's, that's a different term. Smola, sm smoltering. It's the idea of sap. Making, they, they cooked tree sap and made a pitch out of it. And it was clear, kind of like what we think of as varnish or polyurethane. And they covered that thing inside and out. It was watertight. And, and then you got to look at how it was made and all the layers of wood uh, cr overlapping each other and the pegs that would have been used to hold these together soaked in water and no, you put them in dry and then soaked them in water to make them expand and all this kind of stuff. It's pretty interesting. You say, well, they were cavemen back then. They couldn't figure that out. No, no, you got it all wrong. 
Uh, these were not cavemen. They were much smarter than we are today in many ways. We depend on a few smart people to develop <laughs> these things for us and computers and so on. We, de we depend on a few smart people, but as a whole, people are not nearly as intelligent as they were back then. Just look at the structures they built and the expertise that they used and the precision that they had in making those and you'll know that uh, they were very, very intelligent. Yes? Do you know the significance of why God had to make God go through Why God did what? Had to make God go through I'm sorry, I can't understand you. Do you know the significance of why he had to go through Ah. <sighs> There's some talk about uh, the type of wood that it represented also. I don't remember if it was, where have I heard that? Why gopher wood? I don't remember. Seems like I've heard that that was the same type of wood. It was called something different with the, the real Ark of the Covenant, acacia wood, if I remember. It was something related to that, that it might be the same kind of wood even though it's called different things at different times. I don't know. Maybe, I don't know. I've not heard real, like, was there a huge trees that were around where Noah lived? I don't know that. Okay. So that's the ark. The ark is a picture, by the way, of Christ and salvation. The ark was their savior. God had a plan of salvation, a plan for the ark. Told him exactly how to build it, how big to make it, what to do with it. And that was the plan of salvation for them. And so I could use a number of things how this is a picture of salvation of Christ. By the way, they were in the ark for over a year. They lived in the ark for over a year. The um, Bible says, from the tenth day of the second month, through the seven, no, I'm sorry, the 27th day of the second month, the following year, they were in the ark. That's how long they were in it. Of course, they were in it for a week before the flood actually came. And uh, so it was actually about, anyway, so it was a year and 17 days that they were within the ark. All right, now what changed after the flood? Let me give you these things and I will stop. Let me give you these things here. Um, oh, so right after the flood, God made a covenant with Noah that he'd never send another judgment like this again. And that's found in chapter 9. And so the world after the flood was going to be different than the world before the flood. You see, the flood was the end of the old world. After the flood, God set up a new system, a different system of working with man. Um, he was going to, uh, anyway, it's, it's very obvious that to me that in a very loosely speaking that the dispensation before the, the flood was different than that one after the flood up until the time of the law uh, being given about 1500 uh, BC. So there are several things that are different now after the flood. Let me mention to you these things. First of all, <clears throat> when Noah came out of the ark, he had a sacrifice to the Lord. He, he gave a sacrifice unto the Lord. Chapter 8, verse 20. Noah built an altar unto the Lord and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. He took one of the two that were left and killed them, right? No. What did he do? Huh? He, brought he brought seven, actually, yes. And what's the other thing? They were all alive. Okay, yes. They probably reproduced. <coughs> While they were on the ark for that year, they probably reproduced. And so there were more. And anyway, so he, he took up every clean beast and fowl. Uh, verse 21, The Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. This is the way they're always going to be. Now, this didn't surprise God. But God said, okay, um, I destroyed the world this one time, and I'm not doing it again by use of a flood. 
um, this world will be destroyed in the same fashion, not with a flood, but it will be, certainly be destroyed in the same fashion again. Uh, the Bible talks about that in the book of Revelation, in the book of 2 Thessalonians, I believe in 2 Peter also. Uh, the day of the Lord is going to come and He's going to devour this earth with His anger and His great wrath is going to be poured out upon this world. And it'll be destroyed in mass chaos. Read the book of Revelation sometime. Talk about the wormwood star hitting the earth and a third of the people dying on the earth. You just imagine right now there's 7 billion people and a bunch of Christians are taken out at the rapture. Let's say there's even 6 billion left. There's probably going to be way more than that. And 2 billion people die at one setting. Billion. That's all of China, all of India, and all of, uh, what's another country that's over there I was reading? Anyway, but it's humongous countries, the most populated countries in the world, a number of them just knocked out, gone, dead. So this world will certainly be destroyed again in this fashion, but not with a flood. <clears throat> a major, major disaster, obviously, to say the <laughs> very least. Anyway, the one thing that was going to change is the sacrifice. Get back to the thought here. Another thing that was going to change was the seasons on the earth. Verse 22. The seasons would be different. Verse 22. While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. I don't care what the global warming pseudoscientists say. I don't care what the dummies that our politicians say, um, I don't care what they say. While the earth remaineth, this seasons will, these seasons will continue. It's a fact. God said so. But it comes with a warning. While the earth remaineth. In other words, it's not always going to remain. Is there going to be a time where the earth is destroyed? Certainly. Is there going to be a change of seasons? Like drastic? No. Seasons are going to continue forever until God says, so, not forever, but until God says so. While the earth remaineth, seed time harvest, sun, uh, summer and winter, cold and heat. Before the flood, there was no cold. There were no poles of the earth that got very little sun, direct sunshine, and therefore were very, there was nothing like that. And of course, once the flood hit, uh, the, sun, the, the poles of the earth were frozen. And they have remained so, and they will continue to remain so, no matter what Al Gore says. All right, next. Can you hit that button one more time again? Um, there would be also forced dominion on earth by man. Man would have dominion. Man would have dominion over the earth. Verse 2 says, The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon Every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air. So, evidently before the flood, the fear of man was not on the beast the same way it is today. Uh, carnivorous animals were not carnivorous before the flood. They ate grass. They ate the, uh, the, the uh, vegetation. But man would have to take dominion. Man would be the domineering being on the earth, and the animals would be afraid. Um, fourth, the diet was changed. Thank goodness. We get to eat steaks and pork chops and on and on. The diet was changed. Verse number three. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. By the way, we don't eat them, but people around the world eat Everything that moves, everything, dogs, anything, <laughs> bugs, snakes, rats, rabbits, <laughs> everything that moveth shall be meat for you. Horses, <laughs> just ask the Mongolians. All right, next, the diet would change. Next, number five, the government would be instituted. Number Verse number five, and surely your blood of your lives will I require at the hand of every beast will I require and at the hand of the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother will I require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth a man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. By man, by government, 
We're going to set up governments on the earth. And because of man being so sinful, you need more government. The worse people get, the more government they need. More outside government they need. And so that's the way it works, and God set it up that way. And then, of course, lastly, God made a promise to summarize all of this up with a rainbow. By the way, that rainbow has been hijacked by the homosexuals. Um, that's not the way God intended for it to be. Um, and so I've heard of Christians who have taken the rainbow and had their own verses put on it from the Bible, what the Bible actually says about the rainbow. What is the rainbow a sign of? God's judgment upon sin. So <laughs> uh, he'll take care of his own when, it, when the time comes. All right, you're dismissed.